our souls were to be intertwined infinitely one day you'll see we'll meet on the moon looking out to the stars wondrously now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine gotta gotta keep on moving on keep on going keep on This morning we have a treat. We're starting a brand new series called Change. And so last year I met a guy online, which is a weird way to introduce this guy. But I met this guy online uh, on Instagram actually. And I was like, dude, we need to talk. Like what's going on? Because you like my stuff, I like your stuff. But this, informa- this relationship has to go further. Like we got to have a DTR moment. And so we did. We defined the relationship. And so we started talking. We went to some other conferences together. Great guys. Wife actually is better than him. And so, uh, so I asked him, hey, would you kick off the beginning of the year? Would you come and speak? And he's got a book out called Abandoned. Let's check this out. He's selling this as well. He's going to be signing this as well. So uh, uh, let's do this. Let's give him a mosaic crazy. Like just go crazy. Welcome as he comes on up. Come on up, Tim Timberlake. Come on. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome. And his name is his name is Timberlake. So I got my own Timberlake. Anyways, anyway, so. Oh, gosh. Oh, Lord. Can we do a couple of things? Can we put our hands together for you all's pastor, Pastor Naeem, his lovely wife? Come on, we can do better than that. That's it. Can we put our hands together for Jesus? Thank you all for having me. I don't know how I feel about that introduction. He was like, you know, he liked my stuff. I like his stuff. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute now. But it's great to be uh, with you guys today. It's great to be around family. I consider uh, Naeem family, and he, he's just a great guy. And uh, I'm grateful to watch what God is doing through him and through you guys for the community of Charlotte and beyond. Your impact reaches far beyond what you guys know, and I'm grateful uh, to just consider myself a family member of what God is doing through you guys. So uh, you guys are kicking off a series called Change here. How how many of you like change? Raise your hand. Okay, only 10 of you. All right, good. So this series is going to go over well, (laughs) Naeem. Now, how many of you know that you need change in your life? Okay, that's a better response. Thank God. God forbid if we don't change. Can you imagine your homes if they never changed? If your parents' house stayed the same, some of them have, and when you go back and you take your friends, you're like, no, I'm going to warn you, my mom still has plastic on her couch. So just... (laughs) You know, just be very mindful of that. Or, or, you know, the TV never changed. It's still an old TV in black and white. But, you, you know, we got flat screens now. We, we, we got one on the stage here today. Isn't, isn't your church so tech savvy? I mean, today I'm going to go through notes on this thing today. So uh, thank God for change. Thank God that he's changing us. Thank God that he's creating change around us. And so I'm excited about the change that God is birthing in you today. I'm going to speak to you for a moment uh, from the subtopic of spoiler alert. So we're going to read a passage of scripture, we're going to pray, and then we're going to hop right into uh, the talk for today. So uh, the passage of scripture you can find in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have it here on the, the screen. If you do have your Bible, but you don't know where it is, just act like you know where it is. Go to, uh, you know, a chapter, find it, just look important, look, look like you're doing something very smart there, and we'll not know that you don't know where Philippians is. Philippians chapter 1, verse 18 says, But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to Rejoice. You can go ahead and lay your Bibles down, your tablet down. Grab the person's hand beside you. Hold it with expectation, but don't squeeze it. That's the worst thing to do. They kind of squeeze somebody's hand and they have a ring on and they have to act like it doesn't hurt, but on the inside they're really in a lot of pain. So just 
spare them that awkward moment and just hold it nicely like a, a good person would. If you're beside somebody you don't like, just point at them. Uh, we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you, God, for this time that we get a chance to spend with you. Today, God, as we search through your word, allow us uh, to become more like you. Allow our lives to be changed because of your word, God. And we thank you that you give the Panthers the victory today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Scripture says, Scripture says, ask and you shall receive, right? Okay, just getting that out of the way. All right, so back to the scripture, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So what Paul is saying here is it doesn't matter what happens to me. How many of you like movies? Raise your hand. How many of you don't know what a movie is? Okay, three of you. All right, for those others that know what movies are, uh, th there's different portions of a movie. If you haven't seen a movie, the last thing you want is to be around someone that's seen the movie and they start talking about the movie before you see it. Now, th there's this big hysteria going on with Star Wars and people are losing their minds. One person in the back has already lost it just from the name. <laughs> and so... You know, this, this Star Wars movie made, uh, I believe, $1.3 billion in the first weekend. Incredible. I mean, just crazy numbers. Knocking every record out of the box and just, like, setting new records as far as movies go. But, but how many of you uh, know that one of the cardinal laws to Star Wars is you don't talk about the ending before people see it? Unless you're me. I don't care. I mean, I'm just, you ask me how was the movie, I'm going to tell you in great detail how the movie was. This is how it ended. How many of you haven't seen Star Wars in here today? All right, I'm going to spoil it for you. This is how it ends. So and so dies. Um, but the important thing is the movie ends. Because for a long time, I thought that it would never end. But. We don't want to know how movies end because we want to find out what happens for ourselves, right? We, we want to pay $14 and we want to experience it fresh for ourselves because it's a movie and because it has nothing to do with our life. Why, why is it so different, though, when it comes to how we live our life and our relationship with God? We want to know every detail, right? We want to know how our year is going to play out. We, we want to know how the next 10 years are going to play out. If you're single, you want to know who you're going to get married to. If you're married, you want to know when you're going to have some children. If you got children, you want to know when those children are going to leave. You want to know every <laughs> single detail about how your life is going to play out. And this is the crazy thing about it. God doesn't give us this long-term, full, laid-out detail about our life. It gives us our details on a need-to-know basis every single day for the rest of our lives. And for us, that can be kind of frustrating, right? Because we want to know, like, it's our life. We get one of them. So we want to know how this thing finishes. If it's a, if it's a movie, are you an action lifestyle movie person? Or are you a drama lifestyle movie person? You, you want to know how your life plays out. You don't want a horror film as your life, right? You, you don't want that. So you, you ask God, God, show me how my life is going to play out. And he says, trust me with your day. And if you trust me with your day, your week will be good. If you trust me with your week, your month will be good. If you trust me with your month, your years will be good. And that's what Paul is saying here. What does it matter anyway? That there's going to be some good things that happen to you, there's going to be some bad things that happen to you. The, the important thing is, does it matter? And the answer is, no, it, it doesn't matter what happens to you. The most important thing is how you respond to what happens to you in this life. And Paul, he's in a pretty bad situation here. He, he's been locked up for four years off of some false charges that, that he didn't do anything to deserve. And so for two years, he's locked away in prison. After that two years, they're trying to transport him from Caesarea to uh, the next place where he'll spend time. On his boat, he gets shipwrecked, floats to some island 
on the island starts a fire. He's by this campfire, reaches down out of the fire. A snake bites him. And he has the weather the whole winter stranded. Not only that, they come pick up Paul off of this island. They take him to prison. He's in the bottom of this castle in prison. And the, the, the Bible says that he's chained to an armed guard 24 hours of every day. Every four hours, a guard switches off. Here's, here's the messed up part, though. Paul, he's writing this letter in the bottom of this castle. Now, back here in Bible days, the bottom of the castle where was where all the waste went from the city. So he's, he's waist deep in waste. Let me break it down for you. He's standing waist deep in poop. That's a very crappy situation. How many of you would agree? <laughs> and he, he, he has an opportunity to write for about three to four hours a day chained to a guard, and look at what he writes. Verse 18, Philippians chapter 1, what does it matter? What does it matter? What does it matter? The most important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Paul understood something here. He understood what was important was not what had happened to him, but his response to what had happened to him. He understood, in order for my circumstances to change around me, I have to change my mind. And that's the reality for a lot of us in here today. We're so concentrated on what's going on around us that we put very little emphasis on what's going on on the inside of us. And Paul says, I'm, I'm going to leave you guys with a four-piece nugget. He gives us a four-piece nugget. And now, if you're like me, you love chicken nuggets and chicken tenders. I love chicken nuggets and chicken tenders. There are a couple of different places I like them from. I like Chick-fil-A. I believe those people are in the back of Chick-fil-A with their anointed gloves and they're breading <laughs> these nuggets. Delicious little delicate nuggets for me to eat. There's another place I like. I like PDQ. How many of you have ever heard of PDQ? People dedicated to quality. How awesome is that? <laughs> there, there are people out there that are dedicated to fried chicken. <laughs> PDQ is one of them. But none of them lay it down like Paul lays down in Philippians chapter 1. He said, I'm going to leave with you a four-piece nugget. If you're taking notes today, the first peace nugget that he leaves with us is perspective perspective. He says it doesn't matter what's going on around you. What matters is what's going on on the inside of you. See, this is the interesting thing about life, your movie. There's going to be some good times in your movie and there's going to be some bad times in your movie. Look at what Paul says, regardless of what time it is, how you respond to it is more important. Paul says, I respond with joy. Because I know where my help comes from, and I also have a godly perspective of how this thing is going to play out. Let's look at verse 12 in Philippians chapter 1, see what it says. It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, if you're like me, I miss this all the time. That, that was not my perspective growing up. My perspective growing up was if it happens to me, I'm not going to advance nobody's gospel. I'm going to advance my agenda. When I was 13, my father uh, got terminal throat cancer, and they gave him two weeks to live. Uh, my father and mother uh, were uh, preachers, pastors. They were on television every single day. And my father had an opportunity to live this thing out in front of the world to see. And my perspective on it was if this is the way God treats his man, I won't know parts of that God. My perspective was like that because I only knew of Jesus, but I didn't actually know Jesus. 
And so as time went along, I got very bitter, I got very frustrated, I got very upset with God because in my mind, I thought God allowed this to happen to my father. I thought God gave this sickness to my father and my perspective was completely wrong because I was looking from the outside in instead of from the inside out. And something happened. My my father ended up transitioning from this life to the next when I turned 18 And he set me down one day and he talked to me. That day was my 18th birthday. And he set me down and he said, this is what you're going to do. This is kind of how your story is going to play out if you are obedient to God. And that moment, my perspective changed and I realized God didn't allow this to happen to my father. God didn't cause this sickness to come on my father. And then something even greater happened. I transitioned my relationship with Jesus from knowing about Jesus to actually knowing Jesus. And then something even greater happened. I started serving Jesus with my life. And now I have an opportunity to serve Jesus with my mother. And and we serve an awesome community in Creedmoor called Christian Faith Center. And one of the most incredible things that Jesus has shown me is that he understands everything that you will ever go through because he's already gone through it. His word says that he has not been tempted. He has not been overwhelmed. He has not been uh, outcast by anything that you have not already gone through. And you can't go through anything that he has not already gone through. This was important to me because I lost my father. And so as I searched throughout scripture, I didn't realize me and Jesus had something in common. My perspective started shifting. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it chronicles the life of Jesus from a time in his ministry about two to three years when he was already in it. But John chronicled the ministry of Jesus from the very beginning. So we find issues and we find stories and we find scenarios in John that we don't find in the other Gospels. And one of the most incredible things that I discovered was when Jesus was on the cross, he looked down at Mary. He said, Mary, go home with your son, John. John, love your mother, Mary. Jesus would have never told Mary to go home with her son if Joseph was still alive. The incredible thing is this. Joseph died, theologians say, in the third year of Jesus' ministry. Now, this is the most fascinating thing to me because Jesus, the all-sufficient one, the all-powerful one, the one who opened blind eyes, the one who popped open deaf ears, the one who raised people from the dead, had the power to raise his father from the dead, but didn't. Do you know why? Because he loved you, and he had to discover what it was like to lose a loved one. He understood He was going to die before his mother Mary. He also understood that God, his father, would never die. And so in order for him to say, I understand what you're going through, he had to know what it was like to lose a loved one. My perspective changed when I learned that Jesus understood everything that I was going through. But not only just left me there, he gave me a hope. And he gave me a, a faith that even in my lowest moments, he was there. My perspective changed. And so, like today, even though I don't have everything that I once had, I don't have maybe everything that I need or want, I still have this incredible joy because I know even in my rough seasons and good seasons, Jesus is right there with me. Is anyone thankful for that? That that even in bad times, Jesus is right there with you. Even in the best of times, Jesus is right there with you. And his word says, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I'll be with you even until the end of all times. So in order for us to change, our perspective has to change. Let's look at verse 13, see what that says. Verse 13 says, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Look at that. He he says it has become clear to all of the palace guards. Now, think about this. Every four hours, they switch off, which means there's a rotation of palace guards. And what Paul is saying here is all the palace guards know why I'm in chains. They know I'm in chains for Jesus Christ. So he preached the gospel to every single guard that he was shackled to. His mentality was, if we're going to be chained together for four hours, 
you're going to hear four hours about Jesus Christ. And I just wonder, is there anyone in here today that says no matter what I'm going through, no matter how enchained I am, no matter how burdened I am, as long as I'm under that thing, my burdens are going to hear about Jesus Christ. My, my chains are going to hear about Jesus Christ. It, it amazes me how we talk to God about our mountains. But very few times do we talk to our mountains about how big our God is. And I encourage you today just to start talking to those chains, to start talking to those mountains, start talking to those burdens, not about how big they are, but about how big your God is. And I'm telling you, when you start talking to those issues about how big your God is, those issues become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You know why? Because your perspective changes. The, the second thing, the second piece that Paul leaves us with is priorities. Uh, how many of you would agree you got to do a better job with your priorities? Okay, nobody. Okay, I guess I'm the only one that needs to get their priorities in line this new year. But, but there's a few of us in here that understand our priorities sometimes get out of whack and we need a godly perspective. We, we need God's help to help us with those priorities. I'll give you this, this example. You guys had the HOPE initiative. You guys had the initiative for the food drive. And you had a choice whether I'm going to give towards this initiative or am I going to shop for Christmas and get myself something after I get everybody else their gifts. And a lot of you chose to give towards this initiative. Your priorities were in order. But there were some of you who said, you know what? I'm going to splurge on myself this year. I don't got cash for it, so put it on the credit card. You're going to pay for that at the end of this month, I'm telling you, because that's how credit works. You borrow it for a little while, and then you have to pay it back. Listen, don't spend your time getting things you want and negating from the things that you actually need. You, you need your priorities to be in line. And this year, you have to be more determined than ever that your priorities are going to be set from a godly perspective and that everything that God desires you to walk into, you will walk into it because you have him at the center of everything. Not just number one. Because when we say Jesus, you're number one in our life, that implies we have a number two, a number three, a number four. Jesus doesn't want anything else. He wants to be the center focus. And when we have our priorities in line, he is that center focus. The third thing that we're going to look at is power. Power. We, we need God's power to help us in every situation, every circumstance, every scenario of our life. How many of you know you can't make it on your own? Okay, nobody. How many of you know you can't make it on your own? We, we need God's power to help us make it. We have lights because they're plugged into a power source. We have sound because it's plugged into a power source. You have no life if your life is not plugged into the power source named Jesus. You have no life if your life is not plugged into something that's greater than what you actually can see or imagine. And God says, if you give me your life, I'll make something great out of it. If you give me your, yourself, I'll make something great out of it. Do, do you know that when we put our life in the hands of Jesus, better things happen? But when we hold on to our life and we try to direct our own movie, our, our movie goes horribly wrong. God says, everything that you place in my hands will turn out better. You, you, you put the right things in the right person's hands, it turns out better. You, you put a golf club in my hands, and put me in front of a golf ball, the best I'm going to do is cut some grass in front of me. <laughs> but you put a golf club in the hands of Bubba Watson, he's going to win you some PGAs. You put a basketball in my hands, I'm going to hit some jumpers, I'm going to score some layups, I'm going to do okay because I used to play basketball. But you put a basketball in the hands of Michael Jordan, he's going to win you some championships. You put a football in my hands. I'm going to throw it about 20 yards. <laughs> you put a football in the hands of Cam Newton. He's going to get some touchdowns, whether he runs it in or whether he throws it in. But, but the point is, it all depends on whose hands you put it in. The problem with some of us, we've been holding on to our, to our own life, 
And we think we've managed our own life. We think we're in control of our own life. And the reality is we can't control what happens to us. And so we need to return our life to the person who made us. We need to return our life to the person who manufactured us. We need to return our life to the person who's in control of our life so he can make our life better. Our priorities need to change. The last and final piece is purpose. In this four-piece nugget set, purpose is so important. A lot of you are in here, you're starting off the new year, you're wondering, what is my purpose in life? What, what, what am I here for? What am I going to do? What's the meaning of this? And you only find that purpose in Jesus. You, you only find that meaning of what life really is intended to be like in Jesus. Separated from Jesus, you won't find that purpose. But when you attach your life to Jesus, God gives you a purpose. Let let me tell you what that purpose looks like. That that purpose looks a little something like this. Jesus at the center. We love people and then we love ourselves. God's purpose for your life is to invest in something that will outlast your life. If the only thing you do will die with you, then that isn't purpose at all. That the things I want to be involved in, the things that I want to give my life to, the things that I believe I'm purpose for in this life, I pray far outlast my last breath because I have a purpose given to me by an almighty Savior, and his name is Jesus. That there's a question that I like to ask. If you got everything that you've been praying for, would it change you or would it change the world? That's something I want you to ask yourself as you leave today. Your purpose in life is bigger than you. Your purpose in life is greater than you, is greater than what you can imagine. And and I'm here to tell you today, no matter what has happened to you up until this point, your perspective is so key and your purpose is so key when you have a power that is rooted and grounded in Jesus. He says, I'll make the good and the bad turn for your good. Now, that sounds like an awesome movie to me. No matter how it starts off, you already know how it's going to finish. How how many of you would agree that sometimes life is messy? Life is super messy. One of the greatest things that I like about the holidays is the food. I love to eat. One of the most incredible things you experience over the holidays is seeing your family in the kitchen. My my mother-in-law was cooking this Christmas and I walked into the kitchen and the kitchen was super messy, but it smelled so good. And as I walked in the kitchen, I saw all this stuff around. She was making turkey. She had stuffing over here. She had yams over here, flour was over here, it was super messy but but I understood that at the end of this mess was going to come something good and isn't our life the same it's messy there's some things that are going on in your life that you don't understand but like that kitchen so messy, you understand that God is going to make something great out of the mess because it's not what's around you that's important it's what's in you that's important I tell you as I took the first bite of that meal it didn't matter how the kitchen looked all that mattered is what I was consuming what was going on the inside of me and I'm telling you it was delicious I want that to be our life story It, it may be messy around me It may be hectic around me. It may be chaos around me. But I believe that even in the chaos, even in the mess, God is making a masterpiece out of my life. And at the end of it, he gets the glory. That there's a great saying that says, in the end, it is well. And if all is not well, then it is not the end. 
that there's some of you in here today, you're, you're trying to figure out life. You're, you're trying to figure out your circumstance. You're trying to figure out why you're going through the things that you're going through. And today, I encourage you to turn that life over to Jesus. And what Jesus is saying is it is well. The worship team is going to come. They're going to sing. And in this moment, I want you to just reflect. I want you to ask God, what is it that I need to change today so I don't have to take it into my tomorrow? And God, I put my trust in you. And I set my faith to the statement that it is well. But would you stand with us and take a moment to reflect? Turn your life back over to God as the worship team sings.